My name is Paul Douglas, and I'd like to welcome you to this podcast entitled Critical Thinking for Mormons. As I mentioned in the introduction to my book, Critical Thinking for Mormons, Joseph Smith opens the Book of Mormon by penning that it was written to the Lamanites and to Jew and Gentile. My book was written to true believing Mormons and to post-Mormons and investigators. But like the Book of Mormon, the readership of Critical Thinking for Mormons is primarily the latter and not the former audience. My book in this series is intended to provide an introduction to critical thinking and logic, as well as offer a comprehensive guide to logical fallacies. Its uniqueness is the application of this knowledge and understanding to the Mormon paradigm by the rational evaluation and analysis of LDS scriptures, as well as statements made by church leaders, apologists, and members. Critical Thinking for Mormons is based on another book that I've previously written for mainly business school students entitled Critical Thinking and Influential Leadership. What qualifies me to write and lecture on critical thinking for Mormons? After all, the study of logic, truth, and reasoning is largely the domain of philosophy, and my background is hardly that. Rather, it's in business administration, management, consulting, and teaching. Well, as a young man, I wanted to pursue a career in academia, ideally teaching in a business school at a large university. With that goal in mind, I completed the requisite degrees, returning to my alma mater, the University of Alberta, where I had previously completed my four-year bachelor's degree in business administration, as well as my MBA and PDAD to teach in the faculty of business. But as fate would have it, while moonlighting as a management consultant to supplement my rather meager salary, I discovered what I guess you could say was my real passion, teaching leadership, critical thinking, and decision-making. Having come to that realization, I left the university, much to the chagrin, I should say, of my parents and many of my friends, to start a consulting firm. They thought I was mad to leave the security of teaching in a major university to establish myself as a consultant. I mean, after all, everybody calls themselves a consultant. And even though I had degrees in business, in their eyes, there was certainly a reduction in prestige. My work has taken me across the globe, and mostly for financial reasons, I became a citizen of Canada, the United States, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. During these 40 years, I've personally consulted with and lectured on management, leadership, critical thinking and decision-making to tens of thousands of managers and other administrative professionals in more than a hundred of the largest corporations in America, as well as scores of governments and universities, including the CIA, FBI, CDC, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Congress, as well as the governments of Canada, Sweden, Uganda, and Her Majesty's government. I've also done individuals from Princeton University, MIT, UC Berkeley, Penn State, McGill University and the Smithsonian Institution. The point I'm making is that my long career as a management consultant allowed me to view up close and personal both extraordinary management and leadership as well as failed leadership at every level within business, industry, and government, often as a result of poor critical thinking and decision-making skills. I've also witnessed every logical fallacy in the book being played out in the real world. As far as my church creds are concerned, my history of the church is really quite typical. My parents converted to the Mormon church in Ireland before emigrating to Canada when I was a boy. I attended seminary, was a boy scout, married in the Salt Lake Temple, raised five kids in the church, and held numerous stake and ward callings. Like many, I bought into the be perfect notion. Get an education, work hard, build a business, accept all your callings, be a good father and husband, and oh yeah, read the scriptures, follow the prophet, and pay your tithing. As I look back on it now, I realize that while I spend a lifetime teaching others how to make logical decisions, rational decisions, better decisions, I was so busy trying to juggle it all that I literally never had time to apply my particular set of skills to the Mormon church's dominant narrative or the Joseph Smith story. It wasn't until I retired that I found the time to focus my rationality microscope on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. A word or two before we begin. I want to make it clear that while I believe that most Mormons fail to apply critical thinking skills to the church, its histiosity, and leadership, this is not meant to be an indictment. While this book neither presupposes nor denies faith, I believe that faith is important. At its core, faith is the expectation of good things to come. It goes beyond hope. Hope lives in the mind. Faith resides in the heart. It involves accepting that which we cannot establish as true simply through the exercise of our naturally endowed human cognitive facilities. I think this is what Kant was getting at when he said, I found it necessary to deny knowledge to make room for faith. Life can be challenging, and faith in the Almighty can help us get through it, for it provides us with the courage to take the next step, 
even when we can't see the staircase below. I think it's important too, before we begin this journey together, for you to know where I'm coming from. Unlike many who have been drawn to the study of logic and rationality, I am not of the opinion that a belief in God and critical thinking are mutually exclusive. It's not a matter of religion or science, or as sadly too many disillusioned Latter-day Saints come to believe, Mormonism or nothing. I've applied largely the same critical thinking and rational analysis to Christianity, its long history, and of course the life and ministry of Jesus Christ that I have to Mormonism, and I've found that there is truth there. I believe that rationality and logical analysis are vital and reliable mechanisms for obtaining religious knowledge and theological truth, and should not be feared. Religious beliefs acquired through reason as well as faith are more likely to be accurate and enduring. It's crucial, regardless of the discomfort and even the heartache it brings, to have the courage to seek a reality based on more than wishful thinking, emotions, or the proverbial burning in the bosom. The British philosopher Austin Fair noted that rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. In a similar vein, Professor J.P. Moreland, the distinguished American philosopher and theologian, said, Faith involves trusting what we have reason to believe is true. Having said that, I have nevertheless reservations in writing this, as I don't wish my thoughts to assay anyone from their belief in the Almighty, for the sad fact is that many people who leave Mormonism also abandon their belief in God. Please, dear reader, Keep in mind that it's not a matter of Mormonism or nothing. Let's not throw out the Christ child with the Mormon bathwater. Certainly a critical examination of one's core religious beliefs can be difficult, troubling, and painful, as those of you, like myself, who have experienced a faith crisis can attest. After years of research, study, and prayerful searching, I've come to the conclusion that Mormonism is, at a minimum, not what I once believed that it was. I wish it were otherwise, but wishful thinking, correlated conference talks, and emotional videos can't make it so. Mormons, more than most, with the possible exception of Islamic fundamentalists, have been so indoctrinated in their belief structure and varnished truth that it's very difficult for them to go clear. The fear is just too great. There's great wisdom found in the words of Edward Abbey, rather a cruel truth than a comfortable delusion. If you're at a crossroads, if you have doubts, if your shelf is beginning to sag, to echo the words of John Lennon, why not give critical thinking a chance? God gave us a mind so that we might know what's true and what's not. He tells us in 1 Thessalonians to test everything and hold fast to that which is good. In Isaiah 1.18, the Lord pleads with us to come now and let us reason together. This book attempts to apply the principles of critical thinking to Mormonism, as it's preached by its founder, Joseph Smith, as well as past and present leaders their apologists and members. I believe that I'll show in this series that what most Mormons call belief is often merely a deference to authority or referential influence and the unquestioning acceptance of an oft-repeated normative plot or narrative. The philosopher Neil Van Leeuwen called these cognitive errors credences. They're things that we feel we should accept. In short, many religious narratives are accepted without altogether being understood by those who hold them. The sociologist Alan Wolfe observed that many evangelical believers are hard-pressed to explain exactly what, doctrinally speaking, their faith is. He goes on to note that there are many people who believe passionately in God, even if they cannot tell others much about the God in which they believe. There are more than a few Mormons who fall into this category. Some who hold strong religious credences will insist that the Ten Commandments should be the bedrock of our Constitution, but when questioned cannot name more than three or four of those commandments. These credences have been learned. Their narratives have been absorbed from the testimony of others, parents, peers, Sunday school teachers, and general authorities. Accepting them requires a leap of faith, but hardly a theological leap of faith, rather a leap in the mundane sense of simply trusting other people, testifying to their truth. This phenomenon is not unique to religion. Researchers have studied those with strong opinions about political issues and found that they often literally don't know what they're talking about. Often those who take a strident position on global climate change have never researched whether it's real or caused mainly by human activity or just an exaggeration. They oppose cap and trade when they don't even have a clue what cap and trade is. Similarly, some people who firmly believe that COVID-19 vaccines will destroy their children's brains have never taken the time to search out the facts. 
the scientific practice of observation and experimentation, the development of falsifiable hypotheses, and the relentless questioning of established views have revealed the underlying structure of the world in which we live, including subatomic particles and the role that germs play in the spread of disease, as well as the neural basis of mental life. Is it better to get a cancer diagnosis from a radiologist than an Ouija board? Is it better to learn about the age of the universe from Neil deGrasse Tyson rather than Russell Marion Nelson? Is it better to rely on an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine regarding the efficacy of vaccines than Donald Trump? These preferences are not ideological. They're rational because the methods of science are demonstrably superior at getting to the truth about the real world. Yes, scientific practice can be permeated by groupthink as well as financial, political, and personal motivations. But science establishes conditions where rational argument can flourish and where ideas can be tested against the real world. Science has earned its epistemological stripes. And when the stakes are high as they are with climate change, vaccines, or politics, we should embrace it. The word critical means different things in different contexts. However, the word critical, as we use it in the context of critical thinking, does not merely involve looking at the essence of something or criticizing something per se. The two important things to remember is that critical thinking is about not accepting what we read or hear at face value. Thinking and knowing are two different things. A healthy dose of skepticism can be beneficial. Critical thinkers are willing to question what they've been told by the media or authority figures or other people in their lives whom they respect. Critical thinking is the ability to decide rationally what to do as well as what to believe. Critical thinking is analyzing and solving problems systematically, making decisions based on logic and reason rather in, than on impulse or emotion. There are numerous definitions of critical thinking, but there's a general agreement that it's the ability to question and test previously held assumptions. I think we can add to that the capacity to recognize ambiguity, to interpret, evaluate, reason, and make informed judgments. Perhaps the most complete yet concise formal operational definition is that offered by Michael Scriven and Richard Paul. Critical thinking is the intellectually disciplined process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and or evaluating information gathered from or generated by observation, experience, reflection, reasoning, or communication as a guide to belief and action. To me, though, the essence of critical thinking is simply not taking things at face value and not allowing yourself to be sidetracked by emotion. What we're trying to do in this series on critical thinking is to provide you with a new expanded set of skills that will enable you after we're done to understand the relationship that exists between ideas to determine their relevance and importance. Someone with critical thinking skills understands the relationship that exists between ideas and determines their relevance and importance. They can detect inconsistencies, faulty reasoning, and logical fallacies. They have the ability to evaluate and appraise arguments effectively and they can recognize the existence and influence of their own biases. Have you ever found yourself watching a television program, maybe something like Ancient Aliens, only to find halfway through that the producer has it wrong or has a strong bias, which he or she seemingly is unaware of, so you decide that maybe it would be best to switch to another channel? If so, then at the risk of sounding like Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a critical thinker. William James pointed out that many people believe that they're critically thinking when really all they're doing is moving around their prejudices. They base their views on emotion without evidence to support them. He suggests that we need to become much more aware of our own biases and work to overcome them and strive to embrace more objective and open-minded critical thinking skills. Critical thinking doesn't come naturally. We shouldn't assume that people instinctively know how to think critically. Let me ask you a question. Together, a bat and ball cost $1.10. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Take a minute to consider your answer. If you're like most people, you probably think, well, the ball costs 10 cents. If that were true, then the bat would cost $1.10 because the problem states that the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. However, this would mean that the total cost of the bat and ball would be $1.20, not $1.10. The correct answer, of course, is five cents, and the bat costs $1.05, adding up to $1.10. The math here is not very difficult. Why then do most of us get it wrong? The reason is that in order to quickly solve the problem, our brain replaces a harder problem with an easier one. 
Critical thinking skills are often described as higher order skills. That is skills requiring ways of thinking that demonstrate higher levels of insight, sophistication, and complexity than the conventional thinking that we might use, say, to drive our car or brush our teeth or cook a meal. To think critically calls for more than the ability to recall information or follow a routine. Critical thinking involves drawing inferences and forming relative conclusions. For most people, most of the time, their thinking is an auto mode to help them navigate the complex decision-packed world in which they function. They rely on their minds to fill in the gaps. Our minds have an incredible context and pattern recognition ability. If you read a letter filled with all kinds of typos and spelling errors, your mind will quickly sort it out with very little difficulty. This suggests that to some extent, we switch off our brains and go into auto mode at times. By so doing, it allows us to perform many tasks reasonably well without thinking much about them. Let me give you 15 to 20 seconds to read the following passage. And as you do so, count the number of Fs in the paragraph. Well, how many Fs did you count? Three, four? There are actually six Fs. If you didn't get them all, it's probably because you skipped over the three Fs in the word off, which appeared three times. This illustrates how our mind skips over details when it comes to operating in auto mode. There are many times when this tendency will result in our unconsciously distorting information or missing important anomalies. Automatic thinking enables us to make quick decisions and function more efficiently in life. Much of our thinking is automatic. It helps us deal with our experiences and surroundings without having to focus our full concentration on every little thing individually. Sometimes that would be exhausting, even overwhelming. Automatic thinking allows our minds to simultaneously focus on many different things and more important things, such for example, your daily schedule, or mulling over that conversation you had this morning with your spouse, or trying to remember if you turned the stove off or not. By going into auto mode, we make many tasks simpler by freeing up attentional resources so that we don't become overwhelmed by the simplest of tasks. Driving and walking are examples of actions that become automatic. When you sit down behind the wheel in your car in the morning as you commute to work, you don't have to think to yourself, okay, I'm going to put the car in reverse. Next, I'm going to look in my rear view mirror. Okay, next, I can press down on the accelerator and back out of my driveway. Likewise, when you walk, you don't consciously think about every movement or remind yourself to keep putting one foot in front of the other. The behavior is so overlearned and overpracticed that it's become second nature. But as you'll see, auto mode can also make people more prone to mistakes. Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman suggests that our tendency to favor automatic, non-critical thinking is actually hardwired. It's part of our nature and largely adaptive. He suggests, for example, that throughout our history as a species, our survival depended upon it. When a hungry saber-toothed tiger is chasing you, you don't have time to ponder or evaluate your best escape route. You simply run as fast as you can and climb the first tree that you come to. You don't have time to stop, scour the landscape, identify the tallest tree, or the one with the right array of branches that would facilitate climbing. In short, you can't analyze anything. You don't have time. You simply react. Yes, manual or reason thinking can be slow, and sometimes it can be faulty, biased, and susceptible to false conclusions. But since it's not primarily based on the primitive reactive part of our brain, it can help us overcome the deficiencies that automatic thinking can produce. Critical or reasoned thinking engages a different part of the brain and requires more deliberate, conscious mental effort. Our brains consume more energy than any other part of our body, any other organ, nearly 20%. Even though our brain generally accounts for about 2% of our total body mass, we naturally try to conserve energy whenever we can. Therefore, we often rely on old, familiar patterns when it comes to making decisions or forming judgments. We are, at least in this respect, what President Russell Nelson has recently called lazy learners. What we're talking about here is the Gestalt principle of closure, which indicates that our minds are able to derive meaning from pictures or objects that are not fully formed. For example, can you read this sentence? I'm sure you can, even though 25% of the letters are missing. Here's another example. Can you see the inverted triangle? Even though it's really not there, just some black marks. However, Gestalt closure has some troubling aspects. 
In high demand religions, it can be used to guide the investigator to a snapped psychological state by bringing closure to a carefully scripted, predetermined conclusion. That conclusion, conditioned through the presupposition, can cause the person investigating the high demand religion or cult to snap. The newbie to Mormonism is told, if you'll read the Book of Mormon with an open heart and open mind, then I'm sure that you too will see as we do that an inspired book like this, revealed to an ignorant, uneducated foreign boy, could only have come from God. So the investigator goes off and starts plowing through the Book of Mormon, only to be suddenly struck by the new reality that no ignorant, uneducated plowboy could write this inspirational book. It must have come from God. This in spite of the fact that others who have just read the book without any Mormon preparation or conditioning think that it's poorly written, incredible, absurd, and boring. Chloroform in print, as Mark Twain famously said. There are times when unconsciously we'll distort information or miss significant anomalies, or even worse, fall victim to cunning ploys. Critical thinking is manual, not automatic thinking. Critical thinking is the opposite of automatic thinking. It's conscious, it's purposeful, it's mindful. Charles Sanders Pierce, a 19th century American philosopher, identified three types of thinkers, sticklers, followers, and system builders. Sticklers. These individuals cling tightly to their beliefs, regardless of new and mounting evidence that may assail or refute them. Sticklers are only interested in information, data, or opinions that can support their existing beliefs and ignore or dismiss outright ideas or facts that stand in opposition to them. We'll be talking about the confirmation bias fallacy later on in this series, but briefly, this logical fallacy results from the direct influence of desire and belief. It occurs when someone has such a strong desire that a particular idea, belief, or concept is valid that they will inevitably end up believing that it, that it is, in fact, true, often in spite of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. While they'll never admit it and often don't see it, they're motivated by wishful thinking. This error leads the individual to stop gathering or honestly evaluating information that doesn't confirm their beliefs or prejudices, the ones that they wish to be true. Once they've formed this view, they embrace only that information that confirms their belief while ignoring or rejecting anything, and often anyone, that casts doubt on it. Human beings don't believe what they see, they see what they believe. So I start out with an assumption that the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon and anything else <clears throat> excuse me, that we get from uh, the restored gospel is true. Therefore, any evidence I find, I will try and fit into that paradigm. I don't feel that I need to defend that paradigm. I feel that I want to understand the evidence that I find within that paradigm because to me it's a given that it's true. There are others who will assume that it's not true and on these points we'll just have to agree to disagree but we will understand one another better when we understand how our beginning assumptions uh, color the way we, we filter all of the evidence that we find. Followers. These thinkers happily base their beliefs on what authority figures tell them. Absent an authority figure, they'll go along with what the majority of the people agree upon. They rarely question the wisdom of experts or the consensus, accepting blindly these things as true. Followers are unlikely to generate their own ideas and opinions and can be easily persuaded to join a dangerous leader. About two years ago, um, my husband got laid off from his job after being on the job for 10 years. It was kind of a, a scary thing, but one thing that we knew was we were okay because we had followed the counsel of the prophet and we had gotten ourselves debt free and we had up a, a great food storage and so we didn't have any fear. The prophet for a day is not only for the church, it's for the whole world. And I believe that God speaks to him and he in turn speaks to us and let us know the mind and the will of God. Like all that comes from God, this doctrine is pure. It is clear. It is easy to understand, even for a child. System builders. These thinkers are willing to accept new information, providing it fits within the general understanding and framework that they already have. Nevertheless, some system builders are able to overcome their reluctance and embrace new information that shapes their world. Clearly, of the three, these thinkers respond best to rational argumentation. 
just held my tongue about things that did not immediately involve what I was, and that was a historian of Mormon history. And otherwise, I kept all of my reservations to myself and didn't even confide them to very many of my liberal friends, particularly the ERA issue. I just didn't didn't uh, express my, my opposition to what was going on. And my excommunication re relieved me of that obligation. I no longer had to defend the church as a, quote, loyal member. I no longer had to remain silent about things I absolutely thought were reprehensible. And um, that was enormous. And I no longer had to hide or be worried. What I'd been afraid of had happened. And um, I wasn't prepared for that sense of relief that I felt. Any desire to come back? No. No. Um, Still the one true church, but don't want to join. Yeah, it's the one true church, but I'm, I'm an aardvark or a duck-billed platypus of Mormonism. We can also gain additional insight by examining the characteristics of distinctly accomplished thinkers, such as Stephen Hawking or Thomas Edison. Friedrich Nietzsche, Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, or Sigmund Freud, to mention just a handful of critical thinkers who have shaped the modern world. But what, if anything, do they have in common? Critical thinkers are typically curious and reflective people. They look below the surface, often leading to novel insights. Albert Einstein once humbly declared, I have no special talent. I'm only passionately curious. In a Harvard Business Review article entitled, why Curiosity Matters. Francisca Gino writes, the impulse to seek new information and experiences and explore novel possibilities is a basic human attribute. She goes on to say, when our curiosity is triggered, we think more deeply and rationally about decisions and come up with more creative solutions. I can't say that the Mormon church altogether opposes critical thinking, but I would say that it values unquestioning obedience over curiosity. This view is well illustrated in the following excerpt from an editorial that appeared in the Church News reporting the Church Conference of April 7, 1895, in which Wilfred Woodruff stood up and said with annoyance, Cease troubling yourselves about who God is, who Adam is, who Christ is, who Jehovah is. For heaven's sake, let these things alone. Yet there are myriad examples of church leaders giving at least lip service to a solid commitment to an unencumbered search for truth. But is this really what the church believes? Ask Jeremy Runnels, or John DeLynn, or Sam Young, or Fawn Brody, or Kate Kelly, or Michael Quinn, or Simon Southerton, or Paul Tosano, or thousands of others how accepting the Mormon church is to those who question. I think that Elder Hugo Montoya of the 70 is more reflective of the vapid mindset the brethren want their followers to cultivate. Montoya says that doubt can originate from so-called friends who are asking hurtful questions. It can be exacerbated by internet information that is taken out of context. Most of all, though, it happens when we don't close our ears sufficiently to the father of lies and his sinister purposes. The best thing to do, he says, is simply to erase doubt from our minds. Really? Just put it out of your mind? Don't think, don't read, don't search for truth and knowledge? Fernando Montario, Dan Leon Resido. It's also no secret that at BYU and other LDS-owned post-secondary institutions, criticism of the church, its policies, or its leaders is strictly verboten. Even though those who teach at these schools may consider themselves to be free Americans, should they espouse even privately any opinion of which the brethren would disapprove, they run the risk of termination. In June 2017, Ruthie Robertson, a professor of political science, discovered this was the case when she placed a post on her personal Facebook page supporting the LGBTQ community. BYU demanded she retract her comments, and when she refused, she was summarily dismissed. On Christmas Day 2005, the Associated Press, in an interview with Gordon B. Hinckley, asked the president, some scholars say that historical records point to discrepancies with the official church history. How do you reconcile the differences? And what is the church's position on historical scholarship? President Hinckley replied, Well, we have nothing to hide. Our history is an open book. I suspect that one-time church historian Dr. Leonard Arrington might take issue with the president. 
Greg Prince, in his book, Leonard Arrington, and the writing on Mormon history, quotes Arrington as saying, it is unfortunate for the cause of Mormon history that the Church Historian's Library, which is in the possession of virtually all of the diaries of leading Mormons, has not seen fit to publish these diaries or to permit qualified historians to use them without restriction. It was Arrington's remarks that prompted Boyd K. Packer, divorce's now infamous statement, there's a temptation for the writer or the teacher of church history to want to tell everything, whether it's worthy or faith-promoting or not. Some things that are not true are not very useful. In a talk that then-elder Russell Nelson gave to the students of BYU in 1984, which is entitled Begin With the End in Mind, he says, To the charge that the church is anti-intellectual, you are the greatest evidence to refute such an erroneous statement. Individually, you have been encouraged to learn and to seek knowledge from any dependable source. In the Church, we embrace all truth, whether it comes from the scientific laboratory or from the revealed Word of the Lord. We accept all truth as being part of the Gospel. One truth does not... Did you catch that phrase, the one that negated everything that he had said before? Critical thinking is also introspective and reflective. Introspection is the art of being aware of your thinking. The quality of our thoughts reflects the quality of our actions. Thinking about our ideas not only affects our behavior, it often predicts our success. It's the ability to examine our innermost thoughts and feelings, providing insights into our emotional and mental state. The first dimension of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. Abraham Lincoln was once asked how long it took him to write the Gettysburg Address. He replied, all my life, life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. Introspection is an essential feature of critical thinking. But as I've already indicated, it's a luxury that many Mormons don't have time for. Critical thinkers are also commonly creative thinkers. They reject standardized formats for problem solving, choosing instead to think outside the box. Furthermore, they often demonstrate a wide range of interests. I think Joseph Smith was a creative thinker as well as a critical thinker, but the former more than the latter. There is ample evidence of his creativity. His mother raved about how he could keep the family spellbound as a boy, telling delicious stories of the history of the Indians, as he referred to them at that time. There was never a skeleton or an artifact that he came across that he failed to weave some tale around. The Book of Abraham Papyrus, Zelf, the Kinder Book Plates, the Greek Psalter, but I think he was also a critical thinker. That's why he made so many revisions and rewrites to his writings and his revelations. He never stopped thinking about or reconstructing his gospel. The difference between critical thinking and creative thinking is that creative thinking is related to the generation of ideas, whereas critical thinking is associated with the analysis and evaluation of those ideas. Creative thinking is generative, while critical thinking is analytical. Thinking outside the box can take courage. Challenging the status quo takes guts. I got a great deal of flack when I suggested in my letter to an apostle that Mormons are not altogether a virtuous people. Don't get me wrong, I believe that rank-and-file Mormons are good people. The average Latter-day Saint is an honest, kind, decent individual trying his or her best to raise their family with a strong moral standard. They're good neighbors and they're good citizens. Some of the finest people I've ever met were Latter-day Saints. But in Greek, virtuous, enaritos, means more than good. It means courageous. It connotes someone who has the audacity to stand up to authority, who demands truth and personal freedom, someone willing to question the status quo, and if you'll forgive me, few Mormons are that. Latter-day Saints are largely a tractable lot. Too often, obedience has replaced critical thinking, and conformity has replaced courage. Perhaps this is why, during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, when men and women of goodwill in this country were marching with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., seeking equal rights for all of God's children, when we saw Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and even human secularists display the courage to speak up. We didn't hear from Mormons. Rather, they bowed to their leaders who continued to preach discriminatory, racist doctrines, and some would say hateful policies harming persons of color. As late as the 1970s, 
the Mormon church was banning black boys from becoming Boy Scout troop leaders. These leadership positions were reserved exclusively for white priesthood holding Mormon boys. In fact, it took the NAACP to file a federal lawsuit against the church in 1974 to force the church to reverse this hurtful and discriminatory policy. Indeed, in 1966, the NAACP issued a statement criticizing the LDS church, saying the church maintained a rigid and continuous segregation stand and that the church had made no effort to counteract its widespread discriminatory practices. As Jonathan Streeter points out in an article he published in June of 2015 entitled George Romney and the Delbert Stapley Letter, he very well encapsulates and illustrates the gulf that exists between the thinking of Mormon leadership and the heart and mind of American people, including progressive Mormons, in the 1960s. Mitt Romney was not the first Romney, of course, to carve out a notable place in American politics. In 1964, George Romney, Mitt's father, was the governor of Michigan, and like his son, a respected voice for the right. Although George Romney's upbringing in the church certainly inculcated the Mormon teaching of the inferior station in this life of blacks as a result of their lack of valor in premortality, Romney had come to realize the humanity and potential of African Americans. Theodore H. White, in his book, The Making of the President, quotes George Romney as saying, it was only after I got to Detroit that I got to know Negroes and began to be able to evaluate them. And I began to recognize that some Negroes are better and more capable than lots of whites. Despite the teachings of the Mormon church, as governor, Romney made racial equality a top priority, not only campaigning on a civil rights platform, but upon his election, working to fulfill his campaign promises. In his first State of the State address, he declared that Michigan's most urgent human rights problem is racial discrimination. In housing, public accommodations, education, the administration of justice, and employment. George Romney also created Michigan's first civil rights commission and appointed a black man as a special advisor on minority relations. In short, George Romney not only talked the talk, but he also walked the walk when it came to overcoming systemic racism. It was after hearing Romney speak in support of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 that church leaders first attempted to rein in George, who was unquestionably the most powerful Mormon in U.S. politics. On the 23rd of January, 1964, Apostle Delbert Stapley, in a letter to Romney, reminded him of several aspects of LDS theology and the doctrine regarding the Negro. Stapley's letter begins with, Dear George, it was a pleasure to meet and have a moment to visit with you and Lenore here this past week. It's also wonderful to see how enthusiastically you're receiving the good people of Utah. After listening to your talk on civil rights, I'm very much concerned. Several others have expressed the same concern to me. It does not altogether harmonize with my own understanding regarding this subject. Therefore, I thought I'd drop you a note, not in my official church position, but as a personal friend. Only President McKay can speak for the church. As Jonathan points out, Stapley indicates in his writing that he's writing as a personal friend. However, the letter comes on the official letterhead under the heading of the Council of the Twelve Apostles, which would suggest to any true believing Mormon that the letter carries some weight. Stapley continues, I felt, George, your views were most liberal on this vital problem in the light of the revelations, but nevertheless, I cannot deny you the right to your position if it represents your true beliefs and feelings. In 1978, as we're all aware, President Spencer W. Kimball, shortly after meeting with U.S. President Jimmy Carter, announced he had received a revelation reversing the priesthood ban on African Americans, or at least on blacks. On the question of blacks in the priesthood, most of the church's apologists denied that President Carter's meeting with Kimball had anything whatever to do with this timely revelation. Some even claimed that President Carter never even broached the subject. This is simply not true. I asked President Carter personally and directly the question. His reply to me was, Paul, we never threatened them, but I expressed my opinion to the LDS leaders. I think that this Mormon mindset, obedience over independent thought, is also why during the Second World War, not only did German Mormons go along to get along with the Nazis, but as David C. Nelson comments in his book, Moroni and the Swastika, Mormons were not just tolerant of Hitler, they were downright enthusiastic 
The best critical thinkers are analytical thinkers and vice versa. The ability to analyze data is essential. Analyzing information means to deconstruct information to its parts and evaluate how well those parts function separately as well as together. Analysis, of course, relies on observation. The assembling and evaluation of data and evidence to meet a meaningful conclusion. One of the more significant challenges in thinking critically is determining what information is most relevant. While on the surface, having humility and empathy and compassion may seem deleterious to critical thinking. After all, emotion and sentimentality can skew the perception of a given situation. Without humility and the desire to put oneself in the shoes of others, we might view all information and situations from the viewpoint of cold, heartless scientific fact and data. Good critical thinkers take into account the human element. Not everything is about data, information, and outcomes. It's also about people. Critical thinkers are humble while searching for truth. It enables them to learn new things without their ego fighting against them. Those with humility are aware of their flaws as well as their strengths, an important element in critical thinking, as it demonstrates a willingness to stretch and open one's mind. One of the most important constructs to impact American industry that came along during my career as a management consultant is emotional intelligence. One of the essential building blocks of EQ is self-awareness. For decades, I used your Harry's window at leadership development seminars as a tool for illustrating the importance of self-awareness and for improving communication and team building. Joe Harry's window was devised by American psychologists Joseph Luft and Harry M., both at the University of California, Los Angeles. The name Joe Harry's window comes, of course, from a combination of their first two names, Joe and Harry. In a nutshell, the four Joe Harry windows are called regions or quadrants. Each of these quadrants represents information, that is, feelings, motivations, etc., that are either known or unknown by the individual, and whether the same information is known or unknown by others. The four quadrants in this model are outlined on the chart below. Quadrant one is the public you. It's the you that everyone knows and loves. It's the behavior and skills that are, of course, reflective of your attitudes, feelings, and motivations. But it's not the only you. We all wear a mask for various reasons, Mormons more than many. As Mormons, we're under the obligation to be a good example so others will join the church. Our authenticity is to some degree sacrificed on the altar of being a good example. This results in our making the church look good through faking happiness, faking righteousness, faking competency, faking joy, faking a happy marriage. Is it any wonder antidepressant use is so high in Utah? Joseph Smith preached that happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. If I'm not happy, then I'm not living all the commandments. Or I'm not virtuous, faithful, let alone holy. Authenticity is not valued in Mormonism. I can think of numerous examples of inauthenticity practiced by Gordon B. Hinckley or Jeffrey Holland, John Taylor, and many, many others. Quadrant two is made up of those things that are known to us but not known to other people. And I'm not just talking about the skeletons in our closets, and there may be some of those, but the things that we never share with other people. And I don't care how intimate the relationship is that you're in with another person. They'll never know you as well as you know you. Think of the example of the secretly masturbating missionary or bishop or state president, unable to bring himself to confess it, but racked with guilt and self-loathing because of it. Quadrant three is made up of those things that are known to other people, but not known to us. Again, none of us see ourselves exactly as others see us. Robbie Burns, the great bard, said, Oh, what some power, the gift to gee us, to see ourselves as others see us. None of us do. Some of us are closer to reality than others. Some are really out in left field. Higher up the hierarchy, one rises in the Mormon church. The less likely it is that one will be given feedback, constructive or otherwise, by those below. Elder Oaks even codified it. It's wrong to criticize leaders of the church, even if the criticism is true. Alfred Lord Tennyson expressed greater wisdom when he said, he is all fault who has no fault at all. Quadrant four is made up of those things that are neither known by us, nor are they known by other people, yet they exist, and they influence our behavior in profound ways. This is the subconscious, and certainly beyond the scope of this discussion and my training and capabilities. When we think propaganda, most of us think Paul Joseph Goebbels, the Reich Minister of Propaganda in Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1945. But the real father of this dubious art was Edward Louis Bernays, an American pioneer in the field of public relations. 
and a nephew of Sigmund Freud. In fact, Goebbels relied on Bernays' book, Crystallizing Public Opinion, to formulate his vile campaign against the Jews. Bernays was the first to focus on manipulating public opinion through the use of the subconscious. He called this technique of opinion molding the engineering of consent, and it was employed in 1917 by President Woodrow Wilson in the Committee on Public Information to drum up support for World War I. Indeed, in one form or another, it's been utilized to promote every foreign war the United States has engaged in since that time. Not only did Bernays help convince Americans to support World War I, but he also convinced women to smoke cigarettes, Americans to use disposable Dixie cups, and to drink fluoridated water. His philosophy is reflected in his following Orwellian statement, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing about it? The recent practice of propaganda has proved that it is possible, at least to a certain degree and within certain limits. I've got a feeling that Bernays didn't truly believe that there were any limits. Bernays liked to think of himself as a kind of psychoanalyst to troubled corporations. Are there examples of Bernays' techniques being employed by the brethren? In the words of the darling Elizabeth Barrett Browning, let me count the ways. When we self-disclose to others, the public self becomes larger and the private self becomes smaller. When we receive honest feedback from others, it also enlarges the public self and reduces the size of our blind zone. There's a tendency, however, for underlings to be very reluctant to provide honest feedback to the individuals in power. It's the shoot the messenger problem. Enlightened leaders encourage it, but sadly not all who hold the reins of power are enlightened. Who in the 12 has the courage to tell President Nelson to stop with the bogus miracle stories? Why is critical thinking important? Well, for one thing, self-defense. You come home late one evening, it's dark, you're alone. And as you use your key to open the door, you find it's open. Not only is it unlocked, it's ajar. You think to yourself, that's strange. I'm sure I locked the door. And as you step into the foyer, you notice that many things are askew. Items are on the floor that shouldn't be. Pictures are down. It suddenly strikes you that you may have been burglarized. Just at that moment, however, you're suddenly grabbed from behind by a hulk of a man. If you're trained in self-defense techniques, would it increase or improve your chances of survival? Of course it would. Self-defense opens up a source of freedom for women and men in a world where not everyone is kind and honest or has your best interests at heart. The same is true when it comes to critical thinking. And while the antagonist in this arena may not want to do you physically harm, they want you to believe what they believe, value what they value, and do as they want you to do. Who are these people? Pretty much everybody that you'll come in contact with Parents have an interest in exerting influence over their children, even their grown children. Friends seek to influence you, as does your boss, co-workers, and subordinates. But where I think the self-defense analogy fits best is our interactions with large and powerful social institutions, such as political parties, the media, advertisers, and most importantly, large and powerful organized religions. Bodies whose job it is to get you to think as they think and to do as they do, who have enormous resources and expertise at their disposal to accomplish this task. The goal in politics is to acquire support or to gain and maintain power. In the field of advertising, the goal is to sell products and services. And while in the case of high demand religious organizations of the corporate ilk, Mormonism and Scientology being the two best examples, the stated goal may be to save souls, to change hearts and minds and encourage good works. But the real purpose in the organizational or bureaucratic sense is to recruit and maintain membership, followers, so you can acquire their time, their talents, and their fortune. I'm not suggesting that there aren't good people in politics or business, in advertising or religion, who sincerely want to serve the needs of other people. The point is, however, that these institutions themselves often care little about what matters to their constituencies. What they value or see as meaningful is what fulfills them and their viability. These powerful organizations have a logic and a dynamic all their own. But here's the rub. By knowing which buttons to push, these manipulative gods of influence can effectively get us to believe something or do something that is often altogether irrational and illogical. This is the primary reason why we need to enhance our critical thinking skills, self-preservation, and their primary tool is emotion.
Humans are emotional creatures as well as thinking ones. The Greek philosophers realized that people can sometimes be persuaded by the force of feelings and emotions alone. This approach is called pathos. Watch this video. <laughs> Were you able to get through this without weeping? I've seen this a dozen times and I still tear up. We're guided and controlled by our emotions, as exemplified by the fight or flight response that we're all aware of. We feel physical sensations, both positive and negative, because of certain chemicals and hormones being sent into our bloodstream. Our everyday habits and routines and rituals and attitudes and perceptions are all influenced by our emotions so much so that we don't realize that we're being programmed by them. When we become overwhelmed by an emotion, it seems to take over our perception and awareness of life at that moment. The present moment's experience is seen through the lens of the emotion. If we're overwhelmed by joy or happiness or sadness or fear or love or, or lust or any other emotion, we're hard pressed to think or feel anything else. We're feeling and sensing organisms. Well, we've spent today's episode introducing critical thinking as such. The next time we're going to get into the meat of logic and the philosophy behind it. Logic is the greatest contribution that the philosophers have given us mortals. Well, this concludes today's edition of Critical Thinking for Mormons. This is Paul Douglas wishing you all the best. Until we see you next time. Bye.